Hi. What I have here on the workbench today is a Mixic CP503 High Frequency AC-DC Current Probe. Mixic sent in this probe for me to do a review on. And in this video, we'll do some experiments with this probe and get a sense of how well it works. The model we're looking at here has a maximum frequency bandwidth of 50 MHz. Mixic also has an even higher bandwidth model, the 100 MHz bandwidth version, which is the CP1003. Besides the bandwidth limit difference, the operations of these two models should be fairly identical. Also, each of the model has two variants, one with a universal probe interface that connects to a UPI-compatible oscilloscope, like the Mixic STO1004 we'll be using here shortly. And another version comes with a standard BNC connector instead. And that version is the B version. A current probe is a highly specialized device and it's not something that you would use on a daily basis. In fact, a lot of the hobbyists probably have never had the need to use one before. But there are situations that would definitely require the use of a current probe. For example, when designing a switching power supply, it is often necessary to characterize the switching waveform, especially when working with a PFC or power factor correction design, or when working with a power inverter circuit. It is also useful for analyzing transient current waveforms, such as that during a motor startup or from an electronic ballast. Now that I have this CP503 current probe, I'm sure you will see it in use in many of my future videos. Before moving on to experiments, let's do a quick walkthrough of the features of this CP503 current probe. And by the way, the probe comes in with this rather large, exaggerated instrument carrying case. You can see how big the case just is. And let me bring in the carrying case for the DP750 differential probe for comparison here. And you will see that that case is of roughly the same width and length. But the thickness of this carrying case is much, much thicker. Let me just put it up here. You can see how big this case really is. Let me open it up and show you. The case is latched and let me open it. Once open up you will see that most of the space inside is essentially empty. The probe goes right here. The middle section there's nothing in there. But this case does look very rugged and definitely is warranted for a current probe that costs roughly $500. As mentioned earlier, the CP503 attaches to the oscilloscope BNC connector via the universal probe interface, as you can see here. There is no locking mechanism, and the interface is simply snapped on and secured magnetically. Let me show you here. I just power on the scope. By the way, the scope we're using here is a Mixic STO1004, which I did a review a few months back. For those who are interested, you can check out that review video. I will link it up there. Now let me connect the probe. And I'm sure you just heard that. Once connected, you will hear the relay clicking and the probe undergoes some calibration procedures. It only took a few seconds. The controls are very simple. You can use this range button to switch the range. And let me just zoom in a little bit. You can see what is on the screen here. You will see that when I press the range button, the actual range is detected by the oscilloscope. That's because of the universal probe interface we're using here. So now we can switch between 30 amps and 6 amps. We also have these two buttons here up and down, and that is used to adjust the offset of the trace. The display is centered after the calibration routine, but the probe is actually very sensitive to the magnetic influence of the field around it. So you still may need to zero the trace manually using these two arrow keys. And this is especially true if you increased the vertical amplification. For example, right now you can see that we are already deviating from the center line. So for that, we can use this to bring it down. So let's just see here. You can see that we are gradually bring down that trace. And it's not very obvious, but you can definitely see if I zoom it in. You can see the changes of the current here. So of course you can always just by pressing both of the arrow keys and you can do the calibration again. So let me just show you here and that will automatically bring down 
the trace. So we just did a calibration routine, and you can see that the trace is centered once again. Now we have the probe set up. Let's do some measurements, and I'm sure you will find some of them very interesting, so do stick to the end. This probe is for both AC and DC measurement, and it does have a Hall effect sensor, so you can also measure DC current. So let's first take a look at the DC current measurement capability. Of course, I suppose you could just use a regular clamp meter for this task, but with this current probe, you can examine the noise superimposed on the DC component, which is very useful when trying to determine the current waveform from a switching power supply under load. And sometimes you could get a sense of the switching noise by just using a regular oscilloscope probe, which is measuring the voltage across the load. But if the load is nonlinear, which most likely is the case, the voltage waveform you get will be very different from the actual current waveform. Now let's take a look at the measurement setup. Up there I have a switching power supply that is currently powered on, and that is connected to the electronic load. So the load here, I can use it to vary the current that is flowing through. Now let me put the current probe on the returning wire. By the way, you can see that the jaw opens like this. It slides open and uh, it closes and you can lock it in place. So let me open it up and put it on the return of this uh, cable here. And the load currently is set at uh, 1 amp, so let me just uh, turn it on. And you can immediately see we are measuring 1 amp, roughly, on the oscilloscope as well. Here, the RMS is 1 amp. And if I turn it to 2 amps, let me just uh, zoom it out so you can see the whole thing. And you can see that that measurement jumps to 2 amps as well. The current measurement accuracy of the probe is specified at 1%. So you can see that we are largely in line with that. So right now it's 2 amps, and of course we can increase a little bit more to 3 amps. We'll see that. You can see that's uh, 3 amps, and uh, we're reading roughly 3 amps. So that's all good. Of course, what we're really interested to see is the switch noise. Right now, we're in DC measurement mode. You can't really see much, even though you do see a little bit of uh, variation on that trace. But let's change it to AC coupling here. And uh, let me increase the resolution. Let me reduce the time base a little bit. So you get a rough idea of what the noise waveform looks like. Now keep in mind that not everything you see is actually from the switching power supply. So if I remove the measurement wire here, and you will see that we do have a little bit of uh, noise from the probe itself. So let me, for example, keep reducing the vertical resolution here, keep increasing the vertical resolution rather. We're at 4 milliamp per division here, and you can see the noise from the probe itself. This is nothing connected, and just a probe. The noise here we're measuring currently is roughly at 1 milliamp, so that's the baseline of the noise. Now let me put the probe back on, and you will see that the noise from the power supply is actually much bigger than the baseline noise at uh, roughly 4.2 milliamps. RMS. So that's the noise when the current is at uh, 3 amps. And of course the noise level is uh, highly dependent on the load current. So if I reduce the current to 2 amps, you will see that the noise level is much lower. Right now it's at 2.5 milliamp. And if I reduce it to 1 amp, it will be even lower at 1.8 milliamp. Let me increase it to 4, 5, you will see that the noise is getting even bigger at uh, 4.2 milliamps here. And now I have changed the vertical to be 10 milliamps per division, and I want to show you what the waveform looks like when I change the output to exceed the maximum 10 amps rated for the power supply. So now it's 5 amps, and I'm going to load it up. 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11. So now you can see the power supply enters a current limiting mode, and you can definitely see the current noise increased 
significantly, and also there's some periodical current limiting going on within the power supply. In our next experiment, let's take a look at the input current waveform of a non-PFC power supply. Here is the experiment setup. Towards the left, I have a non-PFC power supply. That power supply is hooked up to this power strip. And you can see I have a kilowatt hooked up to measure the power factor. The electronic load is connected to the output of the power supply and is currently off. And if you look down here, the current probe currently is monitoring the input current into the power strip, which I connected the power supply to. And uh, we also are using a DP750 to monitor the input voltage from the power adapter so we can correlate the voltage waveform with the current waveform. Now let me turn on the electronic load. We can see the current waveform on the oscilloscope. At the current draw of 1 amp, we can see the power factor is at 0 0.6869. So now let me increase the current output. And uh, let's see what we got here. At 2 amps, you can see the power factor actually improved to about 0 0.7. And uh, let me increase the current output again, 3 amps. It further improved to 0 0.72. And let's do 5 amps here. And now you can see the power factor actually improved to 0 0.75. Let me try to adjust the trigger to make it a little bit more stable here. Let me also reduce the horizontal time base here. The reason you see this very narrow current waveform is because the large capacitor after the bridge rectifier on these cheap switching power supplies. And they are only charged when the voltage drops below some threshold due to the bridge diodes. So during the voltage cycle, this only happens when the voltage is near the peak. This also explains why when the load increases, the power factor actually gets higher. That's because the capacitor voltage would dip more during the voltage cycle due to the larger current draw, and therefore the charging threshold voltage is lower. Poor power factor not only reduces power line transmission efficiency, but also creates a lot of noise as the current waveform, as you see here, is no longer sinusoidal, but uh, consists of a lot of uh, harmonics. That's why high quality power supplies are almost always power factor corrected. Now let's take a look at the input current waveform of a power supply that has active power factor correction. The setup here is almost identical to what we have done before. And the only difference is that uh, the power supply now is a different power supply. That one is a power factor corrected power supply. The output is 3.3 uh, volts. So I'm setting the current at 30 amps. Of course, right now the load is off. So you can see that without connecting to anything, we already got a very good power factor and it's at uh, 0 0.87 right now. So I'm going to turn on the load and uh, let's see what we got here. From the oscilloscope, you can see that the current waveform is actually approximating a sinusoidal, which matches the phase of the input voltage waveform. So that's why the power factor is very high. Currently, you can see that it is at 0.98. Without getting too much into the technical details, a typical active power factor correction circuitry uses a boost converter topology. And therefore, from the output of the bridge rectifier perspective, there's no capacitor or very small capacitance. The inductor in series is switched via an active device such as a MOSFET so that the current is chopped and spanned the entire cycle. And uh, let me zoom in the waveform just a little bit so hopefully you can see that. And you can see here essentially the sinusoidal wave of the current you can see those uh, tiny switching cycles here. That is due to the chopping of the current. The high frequency components on the current waveform is unfortunately not very pronounced. And that's because we have the input filtering from the power supply. Unfortunately, we cannot remove it. But if we were able to place the probe after the filter, we would be able to see actually a more pronounced current waveform here. The higher the frequency bandwidth of your current probe, the more frequency details you can see when doing measurements. 
Some modern DC to DC converters operate in the megahertz range, and the harmonics goes way beyond that. And that's why having a high bandwidth current probe is essential when doing this kind of measurements. And I almost forgot to mention the current probe is uh, CAT2 rated, and that's why you are able to do this kind of uh, household electronics measurements, including mains related circuitry here. Now let's take a look at the current waveform of an electronic ballast. I took the ballast circuitry from an old projector and built this high intensity discharge lamp unit long time ago. And I will put a card here if you want to know more about that build. So anyway, let me put everything in place and I will power on the discharge lamp and we'll observe the current waveform here. The high intensity discharge lamp is very bright during operation Although I have tried to put it as far as I can, it still may impact the image quality when I turn it on. So just want to warn you in advance. Now let me turn it on. I want you to concentrate on the oscilloscope on the waveform itself. You can see that there are essentially different sequences. At the beginning, there were some very high frequency components. And now we have this, uh, by the look of it, pulse with modulated signal here. And uh, in a bit, you will see that actually the waveform will start changing as well. So let me just zoom it in. Yeah, actually it's uh, quite blinding on the side. Yep, you can see now. So we have this kind of a staircase type of a signal once we have reached a certain operating temperature, I guess. So let me put it, uh, well, let's just keep it the current way. And the waveform definitely is very interesting. As you can see that the lamp is essentially AC driven and the waveform is not just a simple pulse with modulated waveform. I'm sure those who are into electronic ballast design can explain why the waveform is the way it is we're seeing here. Now let me power it off before I go blind. Next, let's take a look at using this current probe to measure the inrush current. A lot of the clamp meters also have the inrush current measurement capability, but how the inrush current reading is derived and calculated is sometimes not very clear and is not specified. So let me turn on the high weights meter and use that to measure the inrush current of an electric drill. Let me just cycle it through. And in fact, let me just put the mix it into a single shot so we can capture the waveform current in the same goal. And as you can see here, we have captured the inrush current from the Kaiwitz. It's 14.67. Uh, and if you look at uh, reading here, so we have this CRMS, that essentially is a cycle RMS, is the RMS value from a single cycle here. So that reading is 15.27 amp. That is actually pretty close to what we have measured on the Kaiwitz. And let me clear the readings and do it again. This time the reading is slightly higher. On the Kaiwitz, we're reading 15.04 amps. And on the Mixit, you can see that the CRMS value is at 15.94 amps. And obviously with a captured current waveform, you get a lot more information than just the inrush current. For example, we can see that we have the RMS value of 8.37 amps, a peak to peak of about 50 amps. So those are the parameters you can measure from the captured waveform here. And lastly, let's take a look at the bandwidth of this CP503. For that, I'm using a Unity UTG962E to generate a 5 volts P2P sinusoidal and dump it into a 50 ohm load. 
Please keep in mind that the measurement here is really just for illustrative purpose. It's not really a true measurement of the bandwidth. This is because the impedance matching here is actually really poor because we have to put the current probe on the conductor here. We have this long split in the coax. Nevertheless, you can definitely get a sense of uh, what is the highest frequency this probe can measure. So let's increase the frequency output. 20 megahertz, 30 megahertz, 40. Yeah, that's what I said earlier. You can see that right now due to reflection, we actually are seeing higher magnitude here. 50 megahertz. And at 50 megahertz, we are still measuring about 75 milliamps. And if you recall, earlier we were measuring about 100 milliamps. So that is largely in line with the frequency bandwidth. Of course, if we start increasing from here, and let me just do it one megahertz at a time, you will see that we roll off very quickly. So right now we're at uh, 60 megahertz, which is the highest the 962E can output. And we're at about 42 milliamps now. Let me just uh, change it back to 10 megahertz. Let's uh, change the waveform to see if we can get a square wave. And this is a 10 megahertz current waveform that is from a square wave. So let me actually reduce the frequency a little bit and let's see if we get any better resolution of the square wave. You can see that at 1 MHz, the square wave looks much nicer, and that's because of the rise time of both the current probe and also the UTG962E. Let me just change the waveform a little bit. Let's uh, change it to ramp, and you can see that we actually have a very good ramp signal as well. So this is at 400 kHz. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you are in the market for a current probe, this Mix 6 CP503 will definitely not disappoint you. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up with you next time.